Amen. There's a verse that's stuck right in between the uh, various things that Peter was talking about, and Jesus does it, and others, others too. And we kind of do that once in a while too. We'll be talking along on a certain subject, and all of a sudden we'll throw something in that has nothing to do with what we're talking about. And then we'll carry on to talk uh, what we were talking about. <clears throat> Amen. Paul does that. Jesus will be talking about something or other, and all of a sudden he'll say something that's way off course, seemingly. Well, Peter, in the third chapter of 2 Peter, he's talking about some things that are serious. There's going to be scoffers and mockers in the end time and carry on and so forth and so on. And then right in the middle of that, before the end of the chapter, he says, But, beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. Remember that? What does that have to do with anything that he was talking about? Then he goes on about the second coming and uh, judgment and various things carrying on. <clears throat> it simply means this. God is eternal. Don't let truth bug you. Don't let things going up or down or however sideways it may seem to bother you. Uh, it's nothing for God to have and be and promote and live and so forth. It's nothing for him. It's who he is. It is what it is. I think it's intriguing when the answer was, tell them I am that I am. That powerful, no questions asked, no need for quarrel. But here in the 90th chapter of Psalms, uh, starting with verse 1, it says, Lord, thou hast been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever thou hast formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. Thou turnest man to destruction and sayest, Return, ye children of men. For a thousand years in thy sight are but as yesterday when it is past and as a watch in the night. There's no point in trying to figure things out and uh, use your mental calculator to see what God is saying here with these two passages that I've mentioned so far. He's simply saying he is eternal. Time means nothing to him. Time doesn't affect him. Time means something to him, but it doesn't affect him like we're subject to time as we are in this world. Now, uh, let's turn to Revelation 20, the book of Revelation, chapter 20. We're going to talk about the number 1,000 tonight, if you haven't figured that out yet. A day with the Lord is as a 1,000 years. Some people have tried to strategize and predict and so forth and so on, but that uh, a comment that Peter made in there where we read in the 90th chapter of Psalm is simply referring to his eternity of his eternal capacity and standing. Amen. Paul said at one point, these things don't move me. He was perceiving eternal things. He had his eyes and focused and his heart focused on eternal things. Yes, we could look at our trouble and say, oh, woe is me, and suffer because of it. Or we could say, this is not going to bother me. I'm going on. The Lord's coming. I'm trusting him and find myself in heaven with him forever and ever. We have a choice, one or the other. Praise God. In the 19th chapter of Revelation, uh, John said in the 11th verse, I saw heaven opened up, saw a white horse, and the one was sitting on the horse, faithful and true, called the word of God in verse 13. And so forth and so on. It says, uh, his vesture was uh, dipped in blood. It's thy name, King of kings and Lord of lords in verse 16. And there's an angel that talks about And then on down the next two or three verses, start talking about the battle of Armageddon. Jesus is coming back at his second coming on a white horse. It says so right there. And other places it says he's coming back with thousands upon thousands of the saints. Amen. <clears throat> Towards the end of the chapter there, it's talking about the battle of Armageddon. And if you recall, if you have studied, and, and all I'll just tell you, in the tribulation time, it's going to be a tough time, ugly time. Uh, you don't want to be here when that goes on. Be ready and prepared to go when Jesus comes in the clouds and will be changed and will go with him, be with him forever and ever. Many powerful and glorious things are going to happen after that. But right here in this passage, we see Jesus Christ coming back on a white horse with the saints. Certain things are going to happen. Battle of Armageddon right at the end of the seven-year tribulation. The beast and false prophet has been involved big time trying to ruin God's business with the Jews, especially the last three and a half years of, of, the, of the tribulation called Jacob's Trouble, Great Tribulation. 
Here in the 20th verse, it says, The beast was taken, and with him the false prophet wrought miracles before him, which he deceived them and had received the mark of the beast, and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. Get that picture just for a moment. Don't dwell on it. Just think about it for a moment. The beast and false prophet is what it's talking about here, and they were cast into the lake of fire alive. Does that make any sense to you? They were cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. And the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon his horse, which sword proceeding out of his mouth, and all the fowls were filled with their flesh. A gruesome, horrible time. Uh, the battle of Armageddon has never been fought. It's going to be accomplished in one day. Never been such a big and awful and, and uh, moving battle uh, warfare in all of history. It's going to make a change. In a big way. There's a purpose for it. There's a time for it. It's going to be at the end of the tribulation time as Jesus comes back to defeat the, uh, the false prophet and the Antichrist to deliver Israel out of their hand. Now, starting with verse 1 in chapter 20, And I saw an angel come down from heaven, John says, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. He's talking about a literal time of span called a thousand years. And I'll explain a little more about that, or the scripture will, here in a minute. There's a purpose and plan why this thousand years is called and described as a literally a thousand year span. I've often wondered, I've tried to calculate, and I don't depend on my calculation because I frankly don't know, but I'm thinking that there's around 40 to 60 generations that will transpire in these thousands of years. I may be way off, but I don't think I'm way off. I may not be very close, but it's something like that. Think about that. 40 to 60 generations that will transpire through this thousand years. What's so interesting about this thousand years? It's going to happen. It will run its course. And there's various things that's going to happen during this thousand years. First of all, it says that an angel got a hold of the dragon, Satan himself, and chained him up for a thousand years, cast him into the bottomless pit, shut him up, and set a seal on him that he should deceive the nations no more till... So there's a time span. There's a start and there's a stop. It says, till a thousand years should be fulfilled, and after that he must be loosed a little season. Now notice in verse 3 it says that the devil will not do what? Deceive anybody during this time. I'm going to read it again. Uh, Set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more till... Okay, he's going to stop for a while because he can't do it for a while. But for a little while, he'll do it again for a little while. <laughs> a thousand years. Think about it. <clears throat> now, let me let you know that we as saints during this particular time, we won't be subject to carnal, physical, and all those kind of things. You and I will have our glorified body because the rapture had already taken place at least seven years prior to this. We've been caught up into the air where Jesus is. Our bodies have, would have already changed in a moment of twinkling of an eye, and we have been with him now for seven years. During the course of the tribulation, now we're talking about the thousand years that will follow. During that seven years, while we're in heaven, we're receiving gifts and rewards and blessings, uh, marriage supper of the Lamb, new robe, new body, all these kind of celebratory kind of things is going on for seven years. A honeymoon, so to speak. A joining of the husband and the wife, so to speak. A lot of rejoicing and celebratory things that's ongoing. Okay, we've gone through the seven-year tribulation as we're talking. Now we're looking at the thousand-year millennial reign of Jesus Christ. Not a whole lot of people talk about a whole lot of millennial reign things, but it's real. We hear about things, and the Old Testament talks about it quite a bit, and a little bit in the New Testament. We're talking about the... Uh, have you noticed that? thing back there under the table? Who, who can tell me what's back there? A lion and a lamb laying together. Not happening now, but in that time, that will happen. There's no schism. There's no conflict. There's no fear. As with a lot of other things like that, where there's no devil, 
There's no ugliness. There's all, <clears throat> well, I won't get into all of it right now, but that, those kind of things the Bible talks about, that will be ongoing. People will live longer. Things will be prosperous, so forth and so on, in the kingdom that Jesus Christ will rule and reign over. Okay, I'm getting kind of ahead of myself, but I'm not apologizing. Uh, Till the thousand years should be fulfilled, and after that he must be loosed a little while. And, John says, and I saw thrones. What does thrones mean to us? Authority, rulership, those kind of things. Saw thrones, and they had set upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, which they had wor not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had given his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years years. Not only the saints, not only the apostles, but certain ones who lived and died through the tribulation time, they definitely are going to have a throne. They're definitely going to rule and reign with the saints. John is saying so right here. It says it's going to happen for a thousand years. Amen. Know and understand, we as children of the Most High, we have already received our, our heavenly body. We're going to live forever and ever. We're going to be in the kingdom. We're going to be subject to Jesus Christ and David. He's going to have a throne big time. And we're going to be kings and priests, as with this mentioning right here, for at least a thousand years. Are you interested in being a king or priest? Are you interested to serve God in the capacity that's beyond where we're at right now? Will you understand? Will you? I've been saying, well, you could or not. Will you understand that we're in training now to serve as a king or a priest or to help those who are serving as kings and priests like an armor bearer? An armor bearer is somebody that's called in it for a divine purpose. An armor bearer serves the one that's serving in a manner that's almost like a twin, almost like a clone, almost the very person. You help them, you serve them, you bless them, you provide, so forth and so on. <clears throat> Anybody know what a butler is? Somebody's there, Johnny on the spot, serve, provide, prepare, all those kind of things. A armor bearer. Don't know why to get off on that. Every one of us can serve in whatever capacity, anybody, anytime, any, for anybody, anytime. That's okay, that's cool, we should. But a certain person is called to be an armor bearer for those who are leading, those who are ministering, those who are promoting and prophesying and carrying on with the work of God. An armor bearer helps, they're there, they provide. Let me put it this way. In the sixth chapter of Acts, there was murmuring. Ain't nobody taking care of the widows. Ain't nobody taking care of this. Ain't nobody taking care of that. <clears throat> Remember that? I'm kind of embellishing on the, on the situation there. Choose you out. Certain people, qualified, filled with the Spirit, to take care of this business so that we're not encumbered with these things so we can carry on with the Word of God. Remember that? Same kind of concept. The armor bearer serves and provides so that they're not encumbered with details. I'm not trying to be bad mouthed. I'm not trying to be ugly. I'm just saying that's a calling that's divine. And some have that. Some have the heart for it. Some can hardly wait to fulfill it. Others don't. <laughs> Is that good enough? Let's carry on. Uh, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years at the end of verse 4. Verse 5 says, But the rest of the dead lived not again until a thousand years were finished. There's another thing. It says about five or six times in this chapter about a thousand years, a specific time that will transpire. Until the thousand years were finished, this is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is that part, hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death had no power. You ought to be sure that you go in the first resurrection. Amen. Amen. Be prepared and ready at any given time. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. Those who are in the first resurrection will have part in a priestly or a kingly position of some sort. I don't know the details, but that is what it's saying. It has, thing, it has to do with royalty. It has to do with uh, spiritual persuasion. In other words, anointing. It has a, bill, it has a concept of the position of leading. Let me tell you something else. You may already know this. Maybe you don't. <clears throat> Maybe you don't want to accept it. Maybe you're still thinking about it. I don't know. When Jesus comes back on the white horse at the second coming, he comes to the earth. He's going to put his feet on the Mount Olive. It's going to split, and various things are going to happen. A lot of people are around still. The church is already gone, but there's a lot of people still around in right now. There's people right now that's not ready to go on the rapture. If the rapture would happen tomorrow, they'll still be here. 
Amen. The seven years course of tribulation will be ongoing. About the middle of it, that Antichrist is going to show up and he's going to demand certain things and it's going to affect the whole world. He's not going to reign and rule over the whole world. He has certain kingdoms that he will. However, it will affect the whole world. You remember something that happened about three, four years ago? He done caught the COVID. It affected the whole planet. It affect. Did it rule and reign and make us do certain things? No. But in certain areas, it was seriously inconvenient. Ships stayed in the harbor for weeks on end. Various things happened. What I'm trying to say is this. The Antichrist is not going to rule the world. Many think so. Many say so. But he's not going to rule the whole world. He's going to rule the kingdoms that he's over. During that time, there's going to be people believing. There's going to be people being agnostic and, and belittling the, the gospel of Jesus Christ. All kinds of things. Uh, big time havoc is going to go on. There's going to be 144,000 Jews anointed and called to preach the gospel for a little while. Just a little while. A year or two. I don't know. Something like that. There's going to be people who call that's never died. Since way back there, Enoch and Elijah, who's never died, they're going to be called to minister and preach during that last part of the tribulation time. They're going to be impressive. They're going to cause miracles and various things. And the Antichrist is going to kill them. They're going to die in the streets of Jerusalem. It says so. Then they're going to be raised. They're going to be caught up. Another kind of rapture. They're going to be caught up. The 144,000 are caught up. With, they're seen in heaven after all of this. It's absolutely marvelous. Okay, we're talking about a thousand tonight. Didn't mean to get off on all of this, but it's absolutely powerful and wonderful and glorious. It's intriguing to me. God's plan and purpose, and we have a part. I want to be in a position that God would choose me for whatever he needs, that I'll serve him and magnify him and glorify him. It doesn't matter to me. Or I might have a preference, but I'm not going to let that overrule what he desires. I want him to say so. Amen. I want him to say so. But don't be so, how should I say this, Lord? Don't be so adamant that, no, Lord, you pick. No, Lord, you choose. No, Lord, when he offers you, make up your mind, do something. Doesn't the scripture say, desire spiritual gifts? Waiting around, well, Lord, tell me. Lord, show me. Dump something on me so I'll know. No, you're the one wanting. You're the one desiring. Or should be, I should put it that way. All right, let's get back on track. At the end of the tribulation, Jesus comes back on white horse with all the saints. And we're talking about a thousand, a thousand, an actual literal time span of a thousand years. Verse 6 says, Blessed and holy is that part in the first resurrection on such a second death hath no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. And when the thousand years are expired, another proof that there's going to be a thousand years that will start at some point and it will end at another point. When it's expired, Satan shall be loosed out. Out of his prison, the bottomless pit, the abyss. When I first read that, first heard that, for several times afterwards, when I experienced that, I thought, why, why, why let the devil out? Keep him where he's at. But it's for a purpose. <clears throat> the thousand-year millennial reign doesn't mean everybody's going to be a goody two-shoes. But the devil's going to be bound. He's can't, he won't be able to deceive anybody. That's true. However, let's just pretend. We're just pretending. Uh, Jesus has come back and the tribulation, Armageddon, and all that's over and the angels have come down and cast the devil in the pit and chained him up and shut him up and all that kind of thing and here we are going into the millennium. Do you remember how to sin? Do you remember how to be selfish? Do you remember how to tell a lie? Do you remember how to be jealous? Yes. We're still capable in our carnal self if we were to live through all that, there's going to be a lot of people that's left here that are carnal, left here that are carnal. It's going to go into a millennium, and things are going to be <laughs> serious. In other words, still capable of doing anything and everything. What the big difference is about Jesus ruling and reigning, it will be with righteousness, like a rock, like a hammer. It's going to be true and faithful and real and dependable. At the beginning of this time, or we should say between Armageddon and when this starts, is going to be the uh, judgment of the nations. All the nations that are supporting and blessing Israel, they're going to go into the millennial reign and live and be subject to the new kingdom. And there might be a group that uh, Ashton might be ruling and reigning over. There might be another group somewhere else that Tammy's ruling and reigning over. These people who have been sort of supporting Israel, don't badmouth Israel. Pray for them. 
However, those who have been against Israel, and many have through the tribulation, and here they are, the judgment is going to come against them, and they're going to be cast out. Whatever's left of all the human beings is who God, who Jesus, who David, who the saints are going to rule and reign and be priests and kings forever and ever and ever over. You're going to live for many, many years. Animals are going to hang out together. Various things are going to be prosperous, so forth and so on. Don't have all the details. They're in there. Not the, that's not the point tonight. Okay, let's carry on. And shall go out to deceive, the devil will, after he's been loosed. How long will he be bound up in that? Well, short time. Various uh, theologians say one thing or the other, but approximately anywhere from two to three and a half years. A good while. A good while. A good while. How successful was the Antichrist during his reign. He was successful to the ones he was making subject to him, who fall for him. You remember uh, the false prophet, that he's going to be able to do uh, 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 miracles, and there's going to be an image that's going to be able to speak. Amen. <laughs> what's, what's the new mechanics and technology out now? AI, is that the name of it? AI. I don't know if that has anything to do with what I just got through saying, but look at it. How is it that everybody on the planet is going to know something in a moment's time? Things are happening. Things are lining up. Be ready and prepared. The bridegroom calleth. He shall go out and deceive. This is what the devil will do after he's loosed out of the, uh, the bottomless pit. The thousand years have expired. Uh, goes out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, in number of whom is as the sand of sea. And they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about and the beloved city, Jerusalem. And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. This is how that end is going to be. This is how, how is it that the devil is going to persuade nations when he's loosed out? It's because everybody in the millennial reign is not going to agree, not going to go with, going to badmouth the rulers. Have we got anybody in our society today that badmouths our rulers? Yeah, they're out there. Don't you be one of them. Don't you be one of them. There's going to be people and during this time that will badmouth the rulers, don't like who's doing whatever, and wish they'd do something else. And when the devil comes back to deceive, they're going to r rally, and, and, rah, 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 and then fire is going to come down. And That's what the Scripture says. Uh, beloved city, and fire came down from God out of heaven to devour them. And the devil that deceived, notice this, this is interesting. The devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and false prophet are. A thousand plus years ago, they were cast in there. And shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. The lake of fire is a place that's real. It's much more severe than hell. There is a place called hell. There's a place called the lake of fire. You remember the scripture that says two or three times of gnashing of teeth out of their mind? It's much more severe than, would you send somebody to get me a, a drink of water? It's much more severe than that. This is where they're going to be cast into, the lake of fire. The lake of fire is real, and that's where all the ungodly are going to wind up. With the devil, the beast and false prophet, anybody else that was coerced by his deceiving at that particular time. And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, Stand before God, and the books were open. Another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. This is talking about the great white throne judgment. This is after the tribulation, after the millennial reign, after the devil has been destroyed with his cohorts. Now, everybody else that has been ungodly from Adam till this point in time are going to be brought up before this judgment. Books are opened. He says, I small the, saw the dead, verse 12, small and great stand before God, and the books were opened. And another book was opened, the book of life. And those things, are, uh, the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. It's a fallacy. It's an ungodly comment, or however else you want to describe it, for somebody to say, works aren't important. You don't have to be involved in works. You're not saved by works, blah, 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 blah. Works are important. 
Every one of us are involved in works. In other words, it's your behavior. What you produce from deciding and speaking and acting, those are works. Amen. Wonderful workings going on here this evening with what we've heard and experienced, but the Spirit edifying through various ones and songs and worship tonight. Wonderful workings going on. Four or five, maybe six times in the Scripture, it talks about good works. Amen. Be zealous about good works. What are good works? Anything we do to obey God. That's simple. That's simple. We don't do that to become a Christian. We already are. We're doing those things because we are a Christian. And we're expected to shine our light. Uh, continue in various things like love and joy and peace and love, uh, brotherly love and grace and all those kind of things to continue in. Good works. Let's carry on. Uh, they opened up the book of life and the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead. They gave up what? The dead. There's folks in the sea that's buried. They're dead. Amen. Not all of them, but the, the sea gave up the dead at this particular time, which were in it. And death and hell, that's definitely something that's been uh, dead for a long time, that's ungodly, delivered up into the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works. Uh, our works is something very serious, something very necessary, very needful. Amen. <clears throat> have you ever been in a predicament and you didn't have enough light and you went and got your flashlight and you turned it on and there's no beam? Anybody ever have had that problem? Amen. God bless you for being like me <laughs> from time to time. It's frustrating. There's no point in having a flashlight if it don't shine. There's no point that God doing what he did and providing what he did to make us who we are that we don't shine. We need to be producing Good works like shining and loving and serving and all those kind of things. Continuing. Yes, there's hesitations or not hesitation, but difficulties and challenges from time to time. That's normal, but that's not a reason to stop. That's not a reason to stop. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. The lake of fire already has the devil, already has the beast and false prophet and all those ugly people that he uh, persuaded at the last time. They were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. I don't know how many times concerning the book of life that it references six or eight, ten times in Scripture. It talks about God's book, the book of life, in various ways it describes it. Old Testament, New Testament. Amen. You remember? Uh, God was kind of disturbed about his folks. And uh, Moses went to bat for him. And uh, he just told God, well, just take my name out of your book. Remember that? So there's a record. God keeps a record. I forgot how that song goes. Uh, found written in the book of life and was cast into the lake of fire. We're talking about simply the concept of the thousand years. As we begin tonight, there's a concept of God's eternal capacity and status it, it's just without measure it's without time it's as uh, as we uh, as peter compared a day as a thousand years there's nothing to it but with this and other places that it talks about this subject there's a specific time when it begins and when it ends certain things will happen before and during and after certain things are uh, uh, ascribed and uh, and written and documented for our nurturing and for our wisdom for our uh, warning Amen. The things in Revelation are practically chronological. There's a few things that's included while it's going on called parenthetical. But the Revelation is primarily chronological. You can follow that, and it will happen practically just like it says. It just had a good example here in this chapter. Certain things going to happen. It's going to begin. It's going to fulfill. When it's expired, those kind of things. And Jesus talks along that way quite frequently. Uh, let's look at 1 Corinthians. We'll finish with this. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I'm living on the hallelujah side. Praise the Lord. 1 Corinthians chapter 15.
Here's another aspect that will be going on toward the end of the millennium. Uh, I'm not sure if it's before or after the judgment. I'm going to guess after the judgment, the great white throne judgment. There's a difference between the great white throne judgment and the judgment seat of Christ. There's a difference. Different place in time. Different individual behind the desk of the throne of the judge. Jesus Christ, judgment seat of Christ. At the great white throne judgment, there's going to be all kinds of authority. God the Father, Jesus Christ, the Holy Ghost, authority there to take care of what's necessary. Judgment seat of Christ is in heaven where the saints are, where they're going to receive reward according to their works. Amen. Okay, uh, verse 24, chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians. Then cometh the end when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, speaking of Jesus, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power. power. During the millennium, this is one of the greatest things or things that are going to be accomplished by Jesus Christ and everyone else helping him, to put down all authority, what's it saying? Uh, put down all rule and authority and power. Yeah. Going to rule with righteousness. A rod of iron, the scripture says. That's how he's going to rule. That's what he's going to stand true and faithful to. That's what we're going to be subject to and promoting. And then get used to it. Start obeying the law now and you'll be more familiar with God's purpose and glory. Amen. Righteousness, holiness, glory and splendor. Yes. Hallelujah. When he shall have put down all rule and authority, uh, uh, authority and power. It says, when he shall have done it. It's going to take, I don't know if it's necessary, but that's the time span. That's what's been set up. 4,000 years it's going to have its beginning. Certain people will get gotten rid of because of their non-compliance of supporting the blessing of Israel. But the rest of them is going to carry on. There's going to be a rulership. There's going to be government, a government. Uh, uh, by Jesus Christ and David and the rest of the saints. Going to rule and reign for 1,000 years. Various generations will come and go. Amen. With all of those people, like this, uh, like we were pretending a while ago, here we are in the millennium. Some saint is ruling and calling the shots, and we're having to follow what they have to say. Under this new kingdom that's ruled with a rod of iron and righteousness and holiness. It's not going to be shifty. It's not going to be paid off by somebody. And it'll all be okay, so they think. It's not going to handle, be handled that way. The people, the natural people that's going to be on the planet at that time will be under that government, rule and reign by the authority that's righteous and holy, subject to that power and that grace. Amen. I'd like to talk more about that, but we'll finish up here in just a moment. Um, uh, for he must reign till, okay, there's another aspect of a time span. He must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. As we read in Revelation 20, uh, all the death and hell is brought up and they're cast into the lake of fire. Um, for he hath put all things under his feet. But when he uh, saith all things are put under him, it is manifest that he is accepted. Which did put all things under him. You know there's a, a, a mandate, there's an expectation, there's however else you want to call it, that God the Father has given Jesus Christ the authority to set up this kingdom and get it squared off and get it squared up and get rid of what's not good and, and, and provide and promote what is good. God is expecting that. You'll see the, the concept here in a moment. Jesus Christ has the authority, has the power, and with others will have the, the have authority and have power to get some things done. For he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet, and the last enemy shall be destroyed as death. For he hath put all things under his feet, but when he saith all things are under him, it is manifest, revealed, that he is accepted, which did put all things under him. In other words, the Father's going to be proud, going to be happy, going to accept Jesus' efforts and all the rest of us' efforts. Accepted which did put all other things under him. And when all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son also himself be subject to him that put all things under him, that God may be all in all. There's going to come a time when this is all fulfilled. Jesus Christ is going to present the kingdom to the Father. Amen. I finish it, Father. I fulfill what you've asked. I've had all these people ruling and reigning with me as priests and, and, and kings. And here it is. It's finished. God the Father is going to be very, very happy and proud and whatever else you may want to describe it as. 
and you and I be included. Let's be prepared and ready that when we get that call of whatever sort, whatever capacity that it is, it says that God may be all and in all. Sister Angela, would you put Psalms 110 and verse 1 up on the ball, please? Psalms 110, verse 1. The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. That was a prophecy way back in David's time, long time ago. You're going to rule and reign until your enemy becomes a footstool. Amen. That was a prophecy. Do you know on the day of Pentecost, chapter 2, if you'll get ready, chapter 2, Acts chapter 2, Peter preached a powerful message. He referred to that very concept, that very prophecy. Chapter 2, verse 34. Acts 2, chapter 34. There it is. For David is not ascended into the heaven, but he saith himself, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my, on my right hand, next verse please, until I make thy foes thy footstool. Peter was conveying the same prophecy concerning Jesus Christ ruling and reigning till all enemy and death has gotten rid of. We're talking about a thousand years tonight. It's real. real. There's going to be a time that begins. That particular time is going to end for a purpose. Things will carry on. After all of that, <laughs> the scripture talks about various times, several times, eight or ten, twelve times in the scripture, Old and New Testament, there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth wherein dwells righteousness. The kingdom has established, has promoted, gotten rid of everything that's ugly and unrighteous, and now there's a new heaven, new earth. And John saw a city, that holy city, coming down out of heaven. Remember that? At that point in time, the new heavens, or the new Jerusalem is going to come down on the new heavens, new earth, and be positioned here on this planet forever and ever and ever. Uh, read it, study it. It's there. There are a lot of things we can ask a question about. Well, how's this? That's, going on. That's normal, but don't let it hang you up. We need to be focused on the Lord. Be uh, focused so much that we want to do His will, serve and represent Him faithfully, that in the hour that He would come, when the hour comes and Jesus Christ appears in the clouds and a trumpet sounds, the dead in Christ will rise first. We which are alive will be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye and we'll all be caught together into the clouds where Jesus is. And that's going to be a catastrophic change in this whole world system. We will be with Jesus seven years, tribulation on the earth for a while, then we'll come back, Jesus is going to set up his kingdom, things will transpire for a thousand years, the ugliness will be taken care of in a few years, very short time, all the death, all the ugliness, all the sorrow, all the tears, everything will be taken completely away. New earth, new Jerusalem coming down, beautiful gates, beautiful streets, dwells righteousness. It's going to be a glorious time. Be ready and prepared when this trumpet sounds. You don't want to be left behind and risk, risk, risk your stability in Christ. Praise God. May the Lord richly bless you. Allow the word to dwell richly in you. Serve and magnify him faithfully. Anyone have a need tonight? You have a particular need you'd like the church to pray with you about?